Welcome to eBible Fellowship's Sunday Bible Study. For broadcast times in your area of these studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now it's time to begin our Sunday study with your speaker, Chris McCann. Good afternoon and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Sunday Afternoon Bible Study. Today will be study number 23 of Jeremiah chapter 50. And we're going to be reading from Jeremiah 50, um, beginning in verse 40, and a few verses after that. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and the neighbor cities thereof, saith Jehovah, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation and many kings shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. They shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon horses, everyone put in array, like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. The king of Babylon has heard the report of them, and his hands wax feeble. Anguish took hold of him, and pangs, as of a woman in travail. And I'll stop reading there. We have been going through Jeremiah 50 for some time now, and we have seen um, over and over again that God is picturing Babylon as a type and a figure of this world at the time of the end of the Great Tribulation, the beginning of Judgment Day, then Babylon falls, and and it is uh, the time of God's judgment on the the kingdom of Satan, on the unsaved inhabitants of the earth. And the Lord related the fall of Babylon to the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, when God rained down fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, that um, Jeremiah fifty verse forty is telling us is similar to Babylon at at its fall. And uh, so we spent a couple of studies looking at Sodom and Gomorrah from the Genesis account. And we can see how uh, the Lord is tying these two together. Now at the end of verse 40 of Jeremiah chapter 50, it says, So shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. And we, we wonder, well, is this saying that um, Babylon will become a, a, such a desolate place that no person will live in Babylon? Is it speaking of people? Uh, obviously, it's speaking of people. Uh, isn't that right? Because it says no man will abide there, neither Son of man dwell therein. And we, we could think that, and that would be incorrect. No, God isn't uh, focused so much on people, but on a particular person. No man. It doesn't say no men, but, but one man. No man will abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. And um, when, when we search the Bible, we find that God often refers to the Lord Jesus Christ as a man without further um, description or without further um, identification of who that man is. In Isaiah 32, in the first couple of verses, It says, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment, and a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Now, God doesn't tell us who that man is, but we know, don't we? Uh, We know right away. What man is as a hiding place and as rivers of water in a dry place or a shadow of a great rock in a weary land? What man can 
match that description but the man Christ Jesus. And, and, and so God will do this in the Bible. He'll, uh, ge- in a generic way, refer to a man and he would expect us to think about the statement and and to um, consider and see, well, what man could possibly fit this kind of description? Over in Jeremiah chapter 5, we read in verse 1, Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. And of course, again, God is speaking of Christ. Go throughout the streets of Jerusalem. And spiritually, that would be as though the Lord is saying, go ahead, search the church all the churches of the world. Go go into whatever denomination you please, into any individual congregation that you want, uh, anywhere in the earth, and, and seek if you can find a man that executeth judgment and seeketh the truth, I will pardon it. No, it's not the pastor, it's not the elder, it's not the deacon, it's not the individual member of the congregation. Find Christ for me. Find the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ within any church in the world, and I will not bring judgment upon the church. And But no man could be found. It, it, it was the time when the Spirit of Christ departed out and left the congregations of the world and immediately the once faithful church, due to the presence of the Spirit of God, became like a harlot and and lost faithfulness in God's sight because there is no man. And, and God is looking for that one particular man, the only man that um, uh, is a true man. And, and that is Christ himself, the, the one who is the essence of truth. In Ezekiel chapter 22, we find similar language. It says in Ezekiel 22:30, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore, have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord Jehovah. And, and once again, the context will not allow for any ordinary man, any uh, ordinary person, but it is Jesus Christ. He's the one that God searched for that could stand in the gap before him for the land, that is, to make intercession, uh, to um, beseech God on behalf of Israel of old, or Judah, and, or beseech God on behalf of the church, uh, that, that God not destroy them. But no man was found, because it was the time of God's judgment. The time judgment began at the house of God, and we read the Holy Spirit comes out. The Holy Spirit comes out of the midst, and and God is very clear that the daily is taken away, and the abomination of desolation set up, and, and therefore God pours out his indignation. He begins the judgment process. Well, uh, the reference to man is Christ, and of course, in our verse, in Jeremiah 50, verse 40, it doubles the statement, basically, when it says, So shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Just in case you didn't catch the first part, 
God puts further emphasis upon it, and he uses the word son of man so that it's even harder to miss because the son of man is the name, one of the names that the Lord Jesus had given to him. And it was said numerous times uh, in the New Testament. For instance, I can turn to one chapter in Matthew 24, and it says in verse 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then again in verse 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And it's found even more times. Son of Man, Son of Man, Son of Man. It, it is none other but Jesus. And, and so that's the point that God is making of Babylon, which was also true of Sodom, but it, it's the point God is making of the world when he brings the final judgment, judgment day at the time of the end. And judgment day began on May 21, 2011. That was the end of the Great Tribulation, the end, therefore, uh, of the 70 years, in a sense, that historical type of the Great Tribulation, and, and the point of Babylon's fall was at the end of the 70 years. The point of Satan's kingdom of darkness and, and, and his fall was at the end of the actual 23-year Great Tribulation period. And then uh, Babylon fell, and, and the Spirit of God departed from the world as far as salvation goes. He no longer dwelt therein. And, and notice that here. So shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. And we, we understand from the word dwell that it, it means to live. You, you dwell in a house. But this particular word is um, only translated as dwell uh, a couple of times. Most often it's translated as sojourn. For instance, in Genesis chapter 35, in Genesis 35, verse 27, it says, And Jacob came unto Isaac his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And we know that that Abraham and Isaac were uh, nomads. They owned no property. They dwelt in tents. And uh, they moved from place to place. In Exodus chapter 12, it says in verse 48, And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, uh, and will keep the Passover to Jehovah, let all the males be circumcised. And I could go to many verses, but, but that's the idea. A stranger sojourning. Uh, as the child of God has learned, this world is not our home. We're passing through. We sojourn like Abraham and Isaac sojourn in the land of Canaan. They dwelt in one area, in a tent for a while, then they would pack up and go to another area, another land. Well, that's how the Son of Man was living in this world. Of course, this world is not permanent, it's not eternal, it, it's, it's a fallen world, and, and therefore God's dwelling in this world is as a sojourn. It, it was a temporary thing. And, and now no man abides there, neither shall any son of man sojourn therein. So God is not 
continuing his stay in this world. He, he has left the world. He's departed from the world in the same way he departed from the church. Uh, obviously, it doesn't mean that God is not here in the sense that, that God is everywhere. Yes, God is still here that way. And it doesn't mean God is not here in the sense that he has left his people. That's not possible. He has told us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And God has given his spirit to, to indwell each one of his elect. So he, it's not in that kind of sense that since the true believers are still living on the earth in a day of judgment, God is with them. But he is not with the world. Uh, we, we can understand it in a similar way as when um, God was only working to bring judgment on Egypt. And, and one of the judgments was a plague of darkness, a thick darkness that might be felt. Well, that darkness was everywhere in Egypt, except the Bible says the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And, and that's the idea in the world now. There is darkness due to the wrath of God upon the unsaved people of the earth, but the children of Israel, the elect, have light in their dwellings, in their own um, person because they have the Spirit of God within them. But everywhere else, everywhere else, for all intents and purposes, the Spirit of God has left. In uh, Revelation chapter 18, it says, and, and this is basically um, describing this same thing, but in different language. In verse 22, And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. And, and that's speaking of Christ and his people. The removal of the gospel is not that God has uh, removed his people or even that uh, uh, he is gone in actuality, but it is there is no more spiritual blessings or light of the gospel shining into the world. And in that way, the, the Son of Man no longer sojourns therein. Okay, let's uh, go on to verse 41 of Jeremiah 50. And it says, Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation, and many kings shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. A people shall come from the north. Who are these people? And uh, we, we wonder, and, and who are these kings that will be raised up from the coasts of the earth? Well, um, first of all, we find similar language in Jeremiah chapter 6. In Jeremiah 6, beginning in verse 22, it says, Thus saith Jehovah, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses, set in array as men for war against thee, O daughter of Zion. We have heard the fame thereof. Our hands wax feeble. Anguish taketh hold of us, and pain as of a woman in travail. Now this is very similar to the few verses here in Jeremiah 50, verses 41 through 43. But notice that this people that come from the north country and are raised from the sides of the earth, that 
even though it's similar, it says they are cruel and have no mercy. And that's exactly what verse 42 of Jeremiah 50 says, that they're coming against Zion at the end of verse 23, set in array as men for war against thee, O daughter of Zion. Now in Jeremiah 50, in verse 42, it says at the end of that verse, everyone put in array like a man to the battle against the O daughter of Babylon. So the difference is that in Jeremiah 6, the target, the object of wrath is the daughter of Zion. But in Jeremiah 50, the object of wrath is the daughter of Babylon. We can see why um, Mr. Camping previously taught and others have thought that uh, Babylon is a picture of the church because it's using identical language. And, and, and so God is just uh, substituting the daughter of Babylon for the daughter of Zion. It's another type and figure of the church. Well, yes, previously, before we understood that God's plan of judgment, the, the spiritual judgment, leaving his people on the earth in the day of judgment, before we understood other information regarding the righteous um, judgment of God, before God gave us that additional understanding of these things, we did think that Babylon is just describing the church and the judgment on Babylon in Jeremiah 50 and 51 is detailing God's judgment on the church. Of course, that's very confusing, very, very confusing. Why would God, throughout the rest of the book of Jeremiah, speak of uh, the judgment on Judah by the Babylonians as an assault of Satan and his kingdom from Babylon against Judah and a command that the Jews were to go to Babylon, which we understood then Babylon to represent the world. And then at the end, in two of the last three chapters in Jeremiah 50 and 51, why would the Lord switch the, the whole thing around and, and now call the church Babylon? That it, it really is confusing. And, and that's because God did not do that. Babylon maintains the type and figure of Satan's kingdom coming against the church during throughout the whole book of Jeremiah. And then in 50 and 51, it is the completion of the judgment on the church. Now it's time for judgment on Babylon, still Satan's kingdom. But uh, why this language then? Why this? And, and this isn't the only example. There are other examples could be given. Very similar, sometimes identical language is used of God's wrath on Judah and God's wrath on Babylon. They must be the same. Is that correct? No. The, the answer for why the similar language is that it is the same cup of wrath. In Jeremiah 25, God says, first, I'll, I'll give the cup of wrath to the people called by, or the city called by my name, and then I'll give it to the nations of the world. And it's the identical cup. And, and so we can read identical language because it is the same spiritual judgment, the removal of of the Spirit of God from the church is what brought judgment and destruction to the churches of the world. The removal of the Spirit of God as far as salvation goes from the world is what has brought spiritual destruction to the world in the day of judgment. It, it is the same cup of the wrath of God. But here, we read of the daughter of Zion in Jeremiah 6 and the daughter of Babylon in Jeremiah 50. Let, let's look at a couple of verses. Um, God 
um, will sometimes speak of a nation or the uh, inhabitants of the nation as the daughters of Egypt. He, he tells us that in some places, or the daughters of Edom in one place. And we uh, often read of the daughter of Zion or the daughter of Jerusalem. In Psalm 137, Psalm 137, it says, beginning in verse 3, For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing Jehovah's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Jehovah, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. So those that carried away the Jews captive, the Babylonians, required of them to sing one of the songs of Zion. And in the same psalm, we read that, it, it is God's intention to take the daughter of Babylon and to destroy her. So we, we find both Zion and Babylon, the daughter of Babylon, mentioned in this psalm. In um, Isaiah 47, in Isaiah 47, it says in verse 1, come down. And sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. And then in verse 5, Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the lady of kingdoms. The word lady there should be translated as mistress, and it's the same word, used of Sarah, uh, or Sarai, maybe at that time. No, I think it was Sarah, who, who was mistress over Hagar. Hagar said, my mistress, Sarah. And, and that is, Sarah had authority over her. Babylon is the mistress of kingdoms. It has authority over the kingdoms of the world. That is, it, it's really representing the kingdoms of the world, Satan's kingdoms. When, when Satan was showing the Lord Jesus Christ all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time on the pinnacle of the temple, that was his kingdom. It was this world. And, and that's what Babylon is representing. In Lamentations 1, Lamentations 1, it says in verse 15, The Lord has trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. He has called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, as in a winepress. Now, I wanted to read this because it's referring to Judah, the, the daughter of Judah, which would be similar to the daughter of Zion. And it has in view God's judgment on the church. But notice the similarity between this and, and we won't go there, but what we would read in Revelation 14, which is uh, without question describing judgment day on the world. And in Revelation 14, Christ is, is treading underfoot the unsaved in a winepress. So again, there is what I was mentioning earlier with the identical cup of wrath. First, the judgment on the church, drink the cup, and it's as though you're trodden underfoot by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the world, you drink the cup, and now you will be trodden underfoot in the day of judgment. And 
th- this is the spiritual judgment that God has brought upon the world. Let's just go to one last place in Zechariah 2. It says, beginning in verse 6, Ho, ho, come forth, and flee from the land of the north, saith Jehovah. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven, saith Jehovah. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. And and here God is putting, again, the two to, uh, the both um, references the Zion and the daughter of Babylon together. And uh, this actually has to do with salvation come out of Babylon, uh, points to uh, entering into the kingdom of heaven through salvation before the final judgment of God would come on the earth. All right, um, let's go back to Jeremiah 50. In Jeremiah 50, and I, I think it'll... Uh, get a little clearer as we look at a couple of other things here in verse 41. Behold, a people shall come from the north. And uh, I think we'll understand that better um, in a little while when we, we look at a couple of references uh, that'll, that'll help us to understand. I know I, I feel like I understand that better. We know historically the Medes and the Persians came from the north against Babylon. So historically, it's not a problem to understand. But um, Babylon came from the north against Judah. And, and that was a picture of Satan and his emissaries coming against the church. But again, this is, this is the final judgment at the time of the end. So the uh, who are these people that come from the north? And, and a great nation and many kings shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. Well, let's um, look at that idea first. Many kings shall be raised up. In Jeremiah 51, in verse 11, it says, Make bright the arrows, gather the shields. Jehovah has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes, for his device is against Babylon to destroy it, because it is the vengeance of Jehovah, the vengeance of his temple. Many kings will be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And Jeremiah 51 11 speaks of the kings of the Medes, plural. And again, historically, I think we can understand that. Darius also known as Cyrus, was the king of the Medes and the Persians. But it was a a vast kingdom. They had conquered many lands. And there would be, in all probability, rulers over these various lands. And they would come together in a, a allied sort of way in order to do battle against Babylon or against the nation that they would conquer. And uh, we, we can think of this um, probably in the same way as in the New Testament. Herod is said to be a king in the gospel accounts, and yet it, he was under Roman rule, Roman authority. And the king with the true power was Caesar, uh, Caesar uh, who was king of the Romans. Yet the Romans had conquered many nations, and so they placed rulers over them, the, these vassal states, when, and they would say uh, Herod was a king or Agrippa was a king, and, and yet they, they were very limited in their power because they were under Caesar. And that's more than likely how it was with the Medes and the Persians and how it was with many kingdoms of, of ancient times. The, there was the true king, Cyrus, and then underlings that, that would rule maybe over individual states, but always reporting back to, to Cyrus or Darius. And, and so Jehovah has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes to come against Babylon. Now, 
We understand how that could be historically. We can also understand spiritually how does God refer to believers as prophets, priests, and kings. And, and so uh, when we read in Jeremiah fifty forty one, many kings shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth, that the Lord is referring to the true believers who are spiritual kings that he will raise up to come against Babylon. And we've talked about this before, as as God, um, in earlier studies of Jeremiah 50, God is saying, proclaim these things against Babylon, and, and it, it's language of doing battle. And the true believers are the army of God, uh, together with the Lord Jesus Christ, fighting against Satan and his forces in the day of battle, judgment day. We, we don't do any actual fighting, uh, no physical, literal fighting, but the Lord uses his people uh, as an instrument of his wrath to bring destruction on the wicked of the world. And uh, that's what's going on here. Now, the, the phrase, coast of the earth, uh, is an interesting phrase, and it's found in two places that are uh, significant. One is in Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah 25, and this is the chapter that I mentioned earlier, where God speaks of first giving the cup of his wrath to the city called by his name. Uh, Or, as he says in verse 29, For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. And should ye be utterly unpunished? Now he's, he's making reference to the nations of the world. Look, I just judged my own people. And uh, are you going to be unpunished? The, the world um, that is just as wicked as my people, I begin to bring evil in the city which is called by my name. And should ye be utterly unpunished? Ye shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith Jehovah of hosts. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words. Who is being prophesied against? The inhabitants of the earth. God is not addressing the city called by his name, but he's talking to the people of the world. And and he, he says, Prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, Jehovah shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Just in case we we didn't catch that earlier, he repeats it. Then in verse 31, a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for Jehovah hath, hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. This is what some people are missing badly. They understand the judgment on the church. Perhaps they're comfortable with it, familiar with it. Maybe they like that idea. And, and so... Uh, they say, yes, God is judging the churches. Oh, but he would not do that to the world. Uh, When we explain, well, what God did to the church, he's now doing to the world. Oh, never. No, no, no. God could not. He would not ever do such a thing. Well, they're missing the point uh, as badly as a point can be missed. In Jeremiah 50, God is saying, look, I judge my own people. Judgment began with my own people. And will the the people who are not my people, the people of the world, go unpunished? No, they'll not go unpunished. In other words, if God removed his spirit from the midst of the congregations and ended salvation within the church 
for 23 years, which he did do, would he not remove his spirit from the world and end salvation in the world upon a people that were not his people? Yes, he'll do that. Without any question, he'll do that. And, and then it says here in, um, that he has a controversy with the nations. In verse 31, he will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith Jehovah. Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. And the slain of Jehovah shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Now there's our phrase, except it's not exactly the same. In Jeremiah 50, it was kings. Many kings shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. Here in Jeremiah 25, in verse 32, a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. It, it has the coast raised up from the coast of the earth, but instead of kings, it says whirlwind. Well, maybe that's not so different after all. Uh, if we look into the whirlwind, Let, let's look at Isaiah 41. In Isaiah 41, in verse 13, it says, For I, Jehovah thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith Jehovah, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small, and shall make the hills as chaff. Now here, where it says in Isaiah 41, verse 15, I will make thee, God is speaking to Jacob, and uh, some may read this and think, well, God uh, is saying, I will make for them, where he says, I will make thee. But actually, the Lord is saying that he will make Jacob himself this new sharp threshing instrument. He is going to turn Jacob, who stands for the elect, into a sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Jacob will become a new sharp threshing instrument. And then with it, thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small, and shall make the hills as chaff. And verse 16 Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in Jehovah and shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. Well, that's interesting, but, but how can that relate? What does that have to do with anything that God is making Jacob a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth, in which thou shalt fan them, and then the wind carries it away? And, and the whirlwind scatters. Well, let's go back to Jeremiah and look at chapter 51, the first couple of verses. Jeremiah 51, 1. Thus saith Jehovah, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind. And that's basically what a whirlwind is, a destroying wind. Then in verse 2, And will send unto Babylon fanners that shall fan her and shall empty her land, for in the day of trouble they shall be against her round about. Fanners. Jacob, I will make you a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth, thou shalt fan her. God's people are the threshing instrument. God's people are fanning Babylon. Uh, and, and then the whirlwind comes, the destroying wind, and blows away the chaff. The, that's the, the picture that God has given. Now, you, you might remember 
uh, what we read in the New Testament in Luke 3. It says um, in verse 16, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And this is the Lord Jesus, whose fan is in his hand. And, and that fan is the body of true believers, the elect Jacob. And God, since it's in his hand, it means it's controlled by his will. God will move his people in the day of judgment to proclaim the truths that he is opening up to them. And in doing so, they will, in, in a sense, be fanning Babylon and, and they will be threshing Babylon. It, it's the time of threshing. Um, I believe it says in Isaiah 21, in verse 9, And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all the graven images of her gods he has broken unto the ground. O oh, my threshing and the corn of my floor, that which I have heard of Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you. See how God is tying those ideas together. Babylon's fall with threshing and with the word of God being declared. Well, uh, the scripture in Jeremiah 25 that says that the whirlwind will be raised up from the coasts of the earth, we can see how that can relate to the kings of the earth, the true believers who are raised up from the coast. But there's another passage um, that I want to go to in Jeremiah chapter 31. In Jeremiah 31, where this phrase, coasts of the earth, is found. And it says in Jeremiah 31, verse 6, for there shall be a day that the watchman upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto Jehovah our God. For thus saith Jehovah, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Jehovah, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and her that travaileth with child together. A great company shall return thither. Here the Lord is speaking of Jacob. Again, Jacob have I loved, representing God's elect, and I will bring them, my elect, from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth. Now, the, the coming from the north country means they're coming out of Babylon. And that's what I, I didn't really understand before. When we read, and we do read uh, in a couple of places, of Babylon being assaulted from the north. And, and yes, we understood the Medes and the Persians came from the north historically. But spiritually, it's the true believers that come out of the north. They come out of Babylon. Uh, in Jeremiah 50, uh, verse 3, For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein. They shall remove, they shall depart, both man in and beast. That is the nation of God's elect, the great multitude that God has saved out of the great tribulation period. They are the people that come from the north. As it says in, again in Jeremiah 50 verse 41, Behold, a people 
shall come from the north, and a great nation, and many kings shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. Well, now with the help of Jeremiah 31, 6 through 8, we can understand it. It, it is the elect Jacob, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth. So uh, each one of these phrases, a people shall come from the north, God's elect Jacob, who uh, in a great nation, it's, it's the nation of God's kingdom. And many kings shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. Everyone that God has saved is viewed by him spiritually as being a king. These are the people that, that God will use as a new threshing instrument, having teeth to fan Babylon, to bring his judgment upon the, the unsafe people of the earth. Well, then in Jeremiah 50, verse 42, it says, They shall hold the bow and the lance. And this is referring to that people that comes from the north, which we now can see conclusively is God's elect. They are going to hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea. And they shall ride upon horses, everyone put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. Well, uh, th that's some statement there. If it's referring to Jacob, God's elect, how can God say they are cruel and will not show mercy? That, that's a terrible thing, it sounds like. How can that be possible if it's God's people? God's people are people of love and compassion. They have the Spirit of God within them. God is love. God is compassionate and gracious and kind and, and full of mercy. And the people of God take after him. God's people love mercy. Well, how, uh, how can these things be? Well, Lord willing, we'll look at what the Bible says about this when we get together in our next Bible study in Jeremiah chapter 50. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship Sunday Bible Study. For more information or to hear additional Bible studies, be sure to visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com.